to America's highest court. The Honorable, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Something different is going on here than what goes on in the Capitol building uh, or in the White House, and you need to appreciate how important it is to our system of government. This is the highest court in the land, and the framers created it after studying the great lawgivers in history. The government concedes that the destruction of documents in anticipation of a proceeding. A lot of these cases are very close and you go in on the knife's edge. You don't sit here to, to make the law, to decide who ought to win. We decide who wins under the law that the people have adopted. You will be surprised by the high level of collegiality here. And if there are four of the nine of us who want to hear any of these cases, We'll hear it. We're here to decide things. The job is to decide. We decide. We cannot have a decision of this court. This court decides important questions, and that means you, you have to do your best to get it right, and you have to work as hard as you can to get it right. Why is it that we have an elegant, astonishingly beautiful, imposing, impressive structure? It's to remind us that we have an important function and to remind the public, when it sees the building, of the importance and the centrality of the law. It always thrills me, amazes me, and gives me faith in our country to know how much people trust the courts. I think the danger is that sometimes you could come into a building like this and think it's all about you or that you're important, and that is something that I don't think works well with this job. Home to America's highest court, the role of those who serve here is to interpret the Constitution of the United States. Outside, almost daily expressions of protests are made by those wishing the court to take up their case or rule in their favor. And inside, a central space dominates its proceedings. All around, there are both public spaces containing the symbolism of the law and artwork reminding us of those that have served on the court before, as well as beautiful private rooms that are seen by those privileged few. But it is the justices, appointed for life terms, who have always defined this legal but very human institution and the building in which they do their work. I think it's the prettiest building in Washington, and it's distinctive. It's a different type of marble, just to start with, much brighter, much lighter than the typical government building, which I think is wonderful because it Right immediately, as soon as you see it, you appreciate that this is something different. It represents that the court is a different branch of government. And it really is more monumental. Um, it looks a lot more like the Jefferson Memorial or the Lincoln Memorial in terms of its uh, visual impact than it does uh, look like another government building. And if you view it as something of a temple of justice, um, I think that's uh, in entirely appropriate. When you first come up the steps from the sidewalk up onto the plaza or forecourt, there are two candelabra on either side of the first set of stairs, and they actually have one of your first symbols, which is a blindfolded justice holding a scales of justice. On the other parts of that base of that candelabra are the three fates, so it's the first symbolic indication that this building has something to do with the law. And then as you travel up onto the plaza, there are the two flagpole bases, which also have some symbols of law and knowledge, indicating that the building has a purpose, which is the Supreme Court and the law. The statue to the left is contemplation of justice. In her right hand, she holds a smaller statue of blindfolded justice. Blindfolded justice is a symbol of impartiality. On the right-hand side of the staircase, the other statue is authority of law. His left arm rests on a book with the Latin term lex, meaning law. 
it's important for the justices, it's important for the attorneys, it's important for the public to make sure that people always want to come up these steps because we're doing the job the right way. And we, not a day goes by where we must not ask ourselves, are we doing this job the right way? I think the Supreme Court is the most mysterious branch to the public. They do their work in a marble building where cameras aren't allowed. They are not recognizable generally to the average person on the street. And then they speak to the public through their opinions. So in some ways, they're very public because anything that they do that will matter in your life will be down on black and white in a court opinion. But yet they themselves will not be publicly announcing that before a camera. So there is a real mystery to the Supreme Court. Its proper role is in a democracy to give a fair and honest interpretation to the meaning of dispositions that the people have adopted, either Congress in statutes or the people when they ratify the Constitution. As simple as that, no more, no less. I think it is time that Americans wake up to what it is the framers had in mind when they tried to create an independent federal judicial branch. They had a clear vision in mind, and that was that the federal courts would be deciding issues of federal law, constitutional and statutory, and that um, those judgments would be binding on all courts, state and federal. When the court tries to do that job, questions which uh, sometimes uh, members of the court disagree about and disagree strongly about, but I think we're all trying to do the same thing, which is uh, to look at the law that exists, the Constitution, the statutes, to figure out what it means, and to apply and enforce it. What the public will see, eventually, is an opinion with reasons. The discipline that a, a judge follows and what makes judges unlike legislators, we don't just say, I vote that the petitioner should win or I vote that the respondent should win. We have to give reasons for every decision we make. When you go in for a big case, that's one with high visibility, where the stakes are really large, where you can feel the tectonic plates of the Constitution actually beginning or potentially beginning to shift, then you would just be brutish if you didn't have an awareness or a high level of sensitivity uh, to, the, to the importance of that moment. The court is very much aware of history. The place is one where continuity is very important and history really does influence the way the court works. At the top of the west steps are the symbolic bronze doors which recognize the history of the law and this court. Just on the other side is the ceremonial core of the building. There is an impressive marble hall that separates the front door of the building from the doors that lead into the courtroom. That marble hall is called the Great Hall. It's characterized by marble columns. Often, when I go home at night, the building is vacant, and I walk through the Great Hall, and I look around at the pillars, and it really impresses upon me the importance of the work that we're doing. As many times as I've walked through that hall, it, it never ceases to, to have that impression on me. Between the columns are busts of chief justices. As you walk from the beginning, you can see John Marshall, Tawney, up to Taft, Charles Evans Hughes, Earl Warren, At present, there are busts of all of the Chief Justices. In a certain sense, you're walking through the whole history of the court. The story of the court is defined not only by its different chiefs over time, but also through continual additions of new associate justices to the bench. The White House operator tells you that the president is on the line. I had the, my cell phone in my right hand, 
and I had my left hand over my chest, trying to calm my beating heart, literally. And the president got on the phone and said to me, Judge, I would like to announce you as my selection to be the next Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And I said to him, I caught my breath and started to cry and said, thank you, Mr. President. Judge Sotomayor, are you prepared to take the oath? I am. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Sonia Sotomayor, do solemnly swear. I, Sonia Sotomayor, do solemnly swear. Justice White uh, always used to say when the court gets a new member, it changes everything, changes everybody. Um, change, simple changes. We move the seats around uh, in the courtroom. Uh, their seats are by order of seniority, so there'll be a shift there. Uh, the same in the, uh, uh, in the conference room. But more fundamentally, uh, I think it can cause you to take a fresh look at how uh, things are decided. The new member is going to have uh, uh, a particular view about uh, uh, how issues should be addressed. It may be very different from what we've, uh, uh, we've been following for some time. So it's an exciting part of uh, life at the court. Oh, the institution doesn't change at all. I think, uh, I think the relationships uh, change. You, you lose a friend and uh, hopefully acquire another one. I, I miss a lot of my former colleagues on the court, from uh, Byron White to, to Bill Brennan. But that's, that's the process. They, they go and new people come on. It's different. It's different today than what it was when I first got here. And I have to admit, you grow very fond of the court that you spent a long time on. There was a period there with um, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor. When we had gone, we had a long run together. And you get comfortable with that, and then it changes. And now it's changing again. It's a new court. Uh, when I was trying to jury cases, it was usually 12, if a juror had to be replaced uh, because one was ill or something, I don't know, it was just a different dynamic. It was a different jury. And it's the same way here. This will be a very different court. And it's stressful for us because we so admire our colleagues. We wonder, oh, will it ever be the same? But I have great admiration for the system. The system works. I think it's healthy for the court to have members with different backgrounds. I think, I think there's, uh, I saw a television program recently when somebody said it would, there should always be someone who had served in the armed forces on the court. And I think it, there should always be someone who's, who has had practical experience in, in litigation. And I think experience in other branches of the government, such as the legislatures, would be very, very helpful. I think that the experiences that, that I have brought to the job are going to, uh, to help me a good deal. I mean, being Solicitor General, you, uh, you get to see the court uh, in everything it does just from a different point of view, from the point of view of the advocate rather than, than, than the judge. But it's been a whirlwind. It's sort of uh, drinking out of a fire hose, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's always something new, something different, a lot to learn. The, the, the learning curve is extremely steep. Sometimes it seems vertical. All of my colleagues have been extraordinarily warm and welcoming. Each one of them has offered advice. Each one of them um, has invited me to call them with questions. And I don't know if there's, I can identify any one in particular that I've been turning to. Actually, it, depends a great deal on whether I'm meeting them in the hall because there's always a question on my mind. And when I meet them in the hall, I just go up to them and say, can you <laughs> or would you? And they've each uh, been delightfully generous in giving me time to walk me through um, whatever it is that I'm asking about. From its first Chief Justice, John Jay, to its current one, John Roberts, the court continues to make decisions that impact the lives of everyday Americans, taking on only a limited amount of cases per term compared to the number of those requested of them. 8,000 ask us each year to hear the case. That means about 150 a week. 
150 what? 150 requests to hear the case. Well, here they are for this week. I think undoubtedly the, uh, to my mind, the, the most, uh, what should I say, onerous and uh, for the most part uninterest, uninteresting part of the job is uh, uh, ruling on all of the cert petitions that come to the court. And they've increased enormously uh, in the time that I've been here. It's an interesting process. We don't try to just, you know, look at the cases that we think are wrong. Um, we don't look at the cases that we think have a lot at stake. Our main job is to try to make sure federal law is uniform across the country. All the cases are hard. Uh, the only reason we take them, as some of my colleagues may tell you, is that other courts are in disagreement most of the time. And that means that uh, other judges uh, and other actors in the legal system have come to differing conclusions. Every case is that way. Most people think they have a right to come to the court. For the most part, you don't. Not this court. Maybe the, the Court of Appeals, you normally do. The, maybe the state courts of appeal and final, uh, uh, the courts that don't have discretionary jurisdiction. The, the, the courts of last resort, maybe they have a right to go to those. But here, most of our jurisdiction is discretionary. In other words, we decide if you come. You can tell if there's a, a, a case that's on a particular hot button issue that people are going to give it a lot of attention. Um, but I have to say that doesn't enter into our process of deciding. Uh, a lot of our docket is very mundane. You go through the year and say we're deciding 90 cases. Probably a half dozen are ones that are going to make it to the front page of the newspaper. All the others, uh, you know, bankruptcy tax case and uh, uh, Federal Arbitration Act case, uh, a, a pension plan case. Those are actually a big part of our docket, uh, all vitally important, but not anything that's going to attract any interest. Even a case on a subject that you think of as kind of boring can turn out to be enormously challenging at the end of the day. It could be anything. So uh, I don't think subject matter determines the extent of your interest in it. It's the challenge of solving this particular question of law and making it work. It could be on any subject. Each one gets a vote, just like anything else, on what cases we should hear, but it only takes four votes to grant cert and decide that we're going to hear a case. Uh, the court used to have a lot more mandatory jurisdiction, cases they had to hear, and when they uh, got Congress to pass a law saying that we didn't have to hear all the cases. It wasn't mandatory jurisdiction. Kind of the deal we made with the Hill was that you didn't need five votes to hear a case. Four would be enough. These are the cases in Justice Stephen Breyer's office that were granted and heard in the courtroom. Behind the scenes, each justice has their own suite of offices. Here they work with a staff of four law clerks and several office assistants. But it is within their own chambers where their personalities and work habits come through. I like to, to be in a quiet place. I like to have my law clerks close at hand. In, in my regular chambers, all of the law clerks were in inside chambers. Now I have two that are in that office and two down the hall. But I like a quiet place. I'm glad to be overlooking a courtyard and not the front of the building. So I'm not disturbed by demonstrators. This desk is made here at the court. All of the chambers have similar desks. The variation in these chambers is that I have put a granite top on the desk. I was very lucky to have this office. It was Harry Blackman's office. He, he was my predecessor here. It's a lovely office. And I think the year before Ruth Ginsburg was appointed and everybody moved because you obtain offices by, by seniority, really. And I was the most junior. But then when I was appointed, no one wanted to move. I said, that's fine with me. I was lucky. It is this view from Justice Breyer's chambers that provides a window into the past of the Supreme Court. Meeting in the basement of the Capitol for the majority of their time between 1810 and 1860, John Marshall oversaw the court from here during his tenure. And later, Roger Taney ruled over the chamber as well. 
until the court moved upstairs into a space vacated by the Senate, where they would meet until 1935. But with very little space available in the building for justices to do their work, and with even less for attorneys to find a place to prepare for oral argument, one Chief Justice determined it was time the court have a building of its own. I don't think it's an understatement to say that this building would not be here if it hadn't been for the persistence of Chief Justice Taft. Taft had in mind that the court needed to have a building of its own. He believed that when he was president, and when he became Chief Justice, it became almost an obsession. There was some opposition in Congress, uh, but ultimately Taft began to chair the committee uh, that was to choose the architect. Gilbert was very much the first choice that Taft had in mind. Cass Gilbert was one of the best known architects of his time, and so it was the perfect match of architect and, and employer. Their idea was to have a building that would comport to Jefferson's concepts and that would look right next to the Capitol building, but still stand on its own. The appropriation that Taft asked for was a little bit less than $10 million. During the Great Depression, there was actually a deflation. And so they were able to build the building and furnish it and still turn $100,000 back to the Treasury of the United States. So it came in under budget. Maybe the only government building in history that came in under budget. Gilbert thought he had done such a great job that the uh, U.S. Uh, capital should be moved so that people would have a better view of the court. That was his view. And I think he did create a beautiful building, but there's no way the capital's going to be moved to provide a better view. Gilbert worked in, in what is essentially a, a sort of French Beaux-Arts classicism. He was very serious in his intention to, to uh, create a, a, a house, and it's symbolic house, for the third branch of government that expressed the seriousness of what we were doing, the authority with which the third branch should be invested, and an authority really to work for what was right. Supreme Court justices are not shy, and uh, some of the justices felt that the new building was too grand, was too grandiose. Chief Justice Stone is alleged to have said that the justices were like nine black beetles in the temple of Carmack, and that maybe they should ride in each morning on elephants. Setting a record with over 75 million pounds of marble used in its construction, when it opened in 1935, seven of the nine sitting justices refused to move into their chambers in the new Supreme Court building. Van Deventer, who was one of the justices at the time who did a lot of work on it, didn't want to leave the former chambers, which were in the basement of the Senate. And he said, if we leave these offices in the Senate, no one will ever hear of us again. Well, he was wrong. Brandeis said he wouldn't come in here. And the reason Justice Brandeis wouldn't come is he said this building is so elaborate it will go to their heads. Now, maybe he was right. But it's become over time a symbol of the court system, the third branch of government, and uh, the need for uh, stability, a rule of law, which is what America stands for. The interesting thing is that neither Taft nor Gilbert lived to see the building completed. Gilbert died only a few months before the building actually opened. As you look at the building today, you not only see the vision of Taft and his architect, but also the work of Taft's successor, Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, who oversaw its completion. And while most visitors see the west plaza of the structure, on its east side is a less often viewed part of the building and its pediment above. The east portico and plaza of the building is surmounted at the top by the east pediment sculpture by Herman McNeil. He was given a lot of rain by the architect Cass Gilbert to design his own ideas for this sculpture. And he chose, since he was on the eastern side of the building, to look toward the eastern traditions of law to choose some of his figures. The central figure is Moses, and then on either side are Confucius and Solon, the Greek lawgiver. 
to either side of those are some allegorical figures that depict various aspects of the law and authority. In the corners on either end are the allegory of the tortoise and the hare. And the idea is that the slow pace of justice or the slow pace of the tortoise carries through in the work of the court and will win the day over the fast pace of the hare. Below the pediment is the statement, justice the guardian of liberty. And that's actually a phrase that Charles Evans Hughes wrote on a memo when they were asked to approve the two inscriptions that were gonna be put on the building. And he said, I'd rather prefer justice the guardian of liberty rather than the one that the architect's firm had suggested. On the opposite side of the Supreme Court is the West Plaza, the traditional public entrance to the building, and also a place where many express their feelings about the court and the Constitution. What do we want? What do we want it now? Well, I'm not sure Gilbert d intended it to be a convenient site for protests, uh, and I'm pretty sure Taft, who was heavily involved in the design and architecture of it, didn't intend it for that uh, purpose either. I understand people having strong feelings about some of the things that we do and we're involved in. But it's not a situation where our decisions should be guided by popular pressure. Uh, and so the protests, to some extent, are, are there as a way for people to express their feelings, but not directed, or shouldn't be directed uh, at us. You would not want us deciding what the Constitution means based on what the popular feeling is. Quite often, and many of our most famous decisions are ones that the court took that were quite uh, unpopular. And the idea that we should yield to what the public protest is is quite foreign to what it means uh, to have a country under the rule of law. Sitting at the top of the West Plaza is the traditional entrance to the Supreme Court. Due to ongoing security concerns, the court decided in May of 2010 to close the symbolic bronze doors as an entrance, while still allowing people to exit the building from here. In a statement critical of the decision, Justice Stephen Breyer said in part, while I recognize the reasons for this change, on balance I do not believe they justify it. In making this decision, it is important not to undervalue the symbolic and historic importance of allowing visitors to enter the court after walking up Gilbert's famed front steps. As you look up from the steps of the West Plaza, you see another symbolic pediment. This one pays tribute to both the history of the law and to some of those integral in the building's construction. What you see in the West Pediment are allegorical figures. The central figure is liberty enthroned, and order and authority flank her on either side. The other figures that are represented in the pediment are those that participated in the construction of the building and also the history of the court. The architect is represented. Chief Justice Taft is represented as a youth while he attended Yale. And you also have John Marshall represented as a young man. Chief Justice Hughes is represented. Even the sculptor, Robert Aitken, is represented in that frieze. Just under the pediment sculpture are the words, Equal Justice Under Law. It's a phrase devised by the architects and approved by Chief Justice Hughes but the words have taken on a larger meaning since then. Equal justice under law is really a statement of the fact that uh, judges ought to be independent, that the law ought to be blind in certain respects and not recognize any differences in terms of people's rights uh, based upon their race or their color or their religion or their background. And the sense that uh, that communicates is that one can stand before the court and expect to be treated fairly. I don't want legalism, I just want the conclusion. In a moment, the justices, on the one hour that can potentially sway them on cases that come before the court. It's the first time we learn what our colleagues think about a case, and that can alter how you view it right on the spot.
You have to pick some number, don't well, you? Well, actually, what like the... eight? Is eight percent? Your Honor, the... You know, a lot of these cases are very close, and you, and you go in on the knife's edge. Persuasive counsel can make the difference. The Supreme Court, home to America's highest court, is one of three original documentaries from C-SPAN included in our American Icons DVD collection. Get your copy for $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Order at cspan.org slash store. And for more information about the Supreme Court, including a virtual tour of the building, the justices in their own words, a photo gallery on the construction of the Supreme Court building, and an interactive timeline on the history of the court, go to cspan.org slash Supreme Court. The C-SPAN Networks. We provide coverage of politics, public affairs, nonfiction books, and American history. It's all available to you on television, radio, online, and on social media networking sites. And find our content anytime through C-SPAN's video library. And we take C-SPAN on the road with our digital bus and local content vehicle, bringing our resources to your community. It's Washington your way. The C-SPAN Networks, now available in more than 100 million homes. Created by cable, provided as a public service. We return now to C-SPAN's feature documentary, The Supreme Court, home to America's highest court. The Supreme Court hears between 80 and 100 cases each term inside this building that was opened in 1935 and envisioned by Chief Justice William Howard Taft. In what the architect called the central node of the structure, the courtroom was adorned with red drapes and special columns made of marble imported from Italy and Spain. But Taft's wish called for more than just a new courtroom. Just outside this space are rooms added to help both the justices and attorneys prepare for oral argument. In the lawyer's lounge, the uh, clerk of the court, and usually the deputy clerk, come in and they give practical pointers. They try hard to put people at ease. It's a fun place to be before going into the courtroom because there's a lot of camaraderie in there. You get to meet your opposing counsel if you haven't met them already. It's, it's friendly. A lot of nervous energy in there, but it, but it is friendly. It's designed to calm lawyers down who are doing their arguments for the first time to make certain that they're not faux pas, uh, that they don't tell jokes or attempt to tell jokes during their oral arguments or not refer to their familiarity with one of the justices uh, and uh, that indeed they will survive the experience and they ought to see it as a place where they can make their best case and the court will hear them and they'll get a fair decision. We want them to enter that courtroom prepared and ready and both sides have an equal chance at, at winning the case. The attorneys are instructed to be there at 9.15 in the morning and they, the regulars all know to be there and come there. Sometimes they don't know each other. You don't know your opponent. It might be New York and California. This is a national court. So it's not just a bunch of attorneys who all hang around the same courthouse. A little different from that. They exchange greetings. They're all glad to see each other. They take their seats, uh, go over the events that are going to occur that day, let them know if opinions are coming down, how many motions for admission, the absences of any justices who might be recused, answer any questions they might have, and offer them cough drops, uh, aspirin, anything like that they, that they might need to make them feel more comfortable. And the attorney uh, feedback I've gotten over the years is they like it very much. As the attorneys get their last minute instructions before entering the courtroom, the justices are preparing for the experience in their own way. First of all, on days of oral argument, a bell a b or buzzer is sounded in each chambers of a justice about 10 minutes ahead, reminding you that in 10 minutes you're supposed to be on the bench. At that point, you need to go down to the robing room to get your robe on and be ready to go into the courtroom at the appointed hour. Uh, chief justices don't like to be late, as you can imagine, into the courtroom. And the robing room just has a number of narrow little sections of a larger cabinet in which the justice's robe or robes are hung, and your judicial collar, if you have one, it, it can be on the shelf. You know, the standard robe is made 
for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and the tie. So Sandra Day O'Connor and I thought it would be appropriate if we included it as part of our robe, something typical of a, of a woman. So I have many, many collars. I'm sure we could do our work uh, without the robes. We could do our work without this glorious building. What the robes, like the building, uh, impart to the people who come here is the uh, uh, significance, the importance of what goes on here. I think that that's a, a profound symbol, that kind of plain black robe that says, I'm going to try to the extent I can not to be guided by any personal experiences or personal characteristics, but uh, to apply the law uh, uh, in the fairest way I think is possible. Those traditions anchor us in a process that's greater than ourselves. They remind us that the role that we're playing is not a personal role, that, and not a role that should have a personal agenda, but one that has an institutional importance, and that that institutional importance is bigger than us. As we enter the robing room, or if we're on the late side, the conference room, the first thing we do is we go around the room, each justice shaking hands with every other. And that's a symbol of the work that we do as a collegial body. That is, you may be temporarily miffed because you received a spicy dissenting opinion from a colleague, but when we go to sit on the bench, we look at each other, shake hands, and it's a way of saying we're all in this together. When all nine are there and accounted for, the Chief Justice says it's time to go, and so you line up in order of seniority, cross the hallway to enter the back of the courtroom, and they divide three justices on the left, three in the middle, and three on the right. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. One of the amazing things about that courtroom, despite its splendor, is the intimacy of it. On the one hand, it's not that big a room, but the real intimacy comes in the relationship between the lawyer who was arguing at the podium and the court that he's arguing to. And if you stop to think of it when you go in there, you will see that if one of us leaned over the bench as far as we could lean, and the lawyer arguing at the podium leaned toward us, we could almost shake hands. And that is a very important thing because it means that when the, when the arguments take place, you are physically and psychologically close enough to each other so that there is a possibility for real engagement. We're just not a bunch of people talking in microphones with a big space between us. So the, the, the happy paradox of that room is that it is a grand room in which a very intimate process takes place. And it is the kernel of a very grand building which has very intimate results for every American. The aura of the place is always present. This is the chamber where Brown versus Board of Education was decided. This is the chamber in which the big steel seizure case was decided. The most important decision in our history in defining presidential power was decided in that room by human beings sitting on that bench after having listened to argument by other human beings. Most cases have an hour uh, per case, a half hour per side. When you tell that to people, they think, is that all? And when you look at some of the other common law jurisdictions, they have a lot more. But 
uh, a lot of the argument's been laid out in writing. Uh, lawyers are not expected, and even if they expect to, they're not going to have the chance to get up and give a speech. A lot of the argument, most of the argument, is devoted to justices' questions. It's very intense. That's what it's really like. You're seated right next to the podium, so you really just stand up and slide over a few inches. And the first thing you have to say under court etiquette is Mr. Chief, Chief Justice, Justice. And may it please the court. The Tenth Circuit in this case correctly held that Stone could not share in the award given by the jury unless he was And then was you're off. An uh, and then you have to, you have a few sentences usually that you have chosen to deliver the court, but you will start getting questions, you know, usually within the first minute or two. Each of the justices uh, has their own unique style uh, about questioning. Uh, we have some people who like, you know, the rapid fire uh, style, others who like to spin out long hypotheticals. I don't want legalism. I just want the conclusion. The, a minute has passed before he says yes. Has that changed everything and it becomes lawful? Would you explain again why it was irrelevant whether the gun was operable or not? What if in your hypo the, the government came along and said, in order to run your hospital, you've got to disclose certain facts. Otherwise, we're going to shut it down. It's the first time we learn what our colleagues think about a case. We don't sit down before argument and say, this is what we think, or this is how I view the case. Uh, we come to it cold as far as knowing what um, everybody thinks. And so through the questioning, we're learning for the first time what the other justices view, how they view the case. And that can alter how you view it right on the spot. And if they're raising questions about an issue that you hadn't thought was important, you can start looking into that issue during the questioning a, a, a little bit. So it's a very dynamic and very exciting part of the job. There are nine people uh, up there, and I'm with them, and we're talking. This is a conversation. And I really, I, I have no awareness of the courtroom, the people in the, the courtroom, any physical movements that may be going on. It's really quite remarkable. My philosophy is to ask questions when I think the answer might give me a little help in deciding the case. I, I don't view the, the participation as a, of a justice as an opportunity for the justice to uh, advocate one point of view. I think rather the, the questioning should be designed to help understand what the arguments on both sides are in order to enable the justice to uh, reach a decision. To sit on the Supreme Court and listen to the questions of your colleagues is somewhat humbling. The moment that I sat down and was able to look out and see all of the people in the audience, that's probably the moment I will most intensely remember because there were lawyers who I've known for years sitting at the table in front of us ready to argue, but then watching the intensity of everyone's face. And I'd forgotten how much people believe, that, believe and know that they're affected by the court's decisions. Every question I ask has a purpose. It has some importance to something that is troubling me or that I'm curious about. As an attorney, I welcomed questions from the bench. I know that some lawyers regard questions as an interruption in an, in an eloquent speech that they are preparing, prepared to make. But an advocate wants to know what's on the judge's mind. So she will welcome questions as a way of satisfying the judge on a matter the judge might not resolve as well without counsel's response. It's all about just uh, fielding those questions and using the time strategically so that you respond to the questions. It's essential to answer the questions. You can't persuade a justice if you don't answer what they have asked. They're very demanding as they should be. That's, that's their job. It's a very challenging exercise. Is 2% a critical mass, Ms. Mahoney? I don't think so, Your Honor. 4%? Okay. Uh, uh, no, Your Honor. What you have to pick some number, don't well, you? Well, actually, what like the... Like 8 is 8%? Your Honor, the... Now, does it stop being a quota because it's somewhere between 8 and, and 12, but it is a quota if it's 10? A lot of people uh, have the impression that it's just a dog and pony show. What can somebody tell me in half an hour that's going to make a difference? 
And the answer is that uh, it, is, it is probably quite rare, although not unheard of, that oral argument will change my mind. But it is quite common that I go in with my mind not made up. I mean, a lot of these cases are very close and you, and you go in on the knife's edge. Persuasive counsel can make the difference. I once had an argument where I think they asked 56 questions in 30 minutes. So it's a lot of questions. And yes, they, they interrupt each other even. It had been my practice on the Court of Appeals to try to wait for sort of the end of the lawyer's paragraph before interrupting with a question. And here I learned if you do that, or even if you, in a, in a hot case, if you end, wait till the end of a sentence, you will never get a question in. You have to be, you have to interrupt uh, to, to, to make your voice heard. The argument is, is for us to say, well, yeah, we've read your brief. We know what you think of the case, but here are the questions that that inspired in us. You know, here are the concerns we have, or here are the uncertainties that you left open, and, uh, and use oral argument in order to do that. I guess I view oral argument a little bit differently. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for the advocate, uh, the lawyers, to fill in the blanks. I think it's hard to have a conversation when nobody's listening, when you can't complete sentences or answers. Perhaps that's a Southern thing, I don't know. But I think you should allow people to complete their answers and their thought and to continue their conversation. I find that that coherence that you get from a conversation far more helpful than the rapid fire questions. I, mean, I don't see how you can learn a whole lot when there are 50 questions and a half in an hour. One of the bad signs of an oral argument is when the questions stop. It means that you know, you've either not persuaded them or they, they figured it out already and there's nothing more you can add. A white light will go on when you have five minutes remaining. And when your time has expired, a red light goes on. When the red light goes on, you are supposed to stop. It's an exciting part of the process. I'm going to learn what my colleagues think about a case that I've been studying for a long time, for the very first time. I'm going to hear what the lawyers have to say. Um, so it's an exciting day. Sometimes I say to myself, am I really there or is it all a dream? It's one of the most beautiful courtrooms, I think, in the world. There's a hush that comes over people as they walk in. There's a reverence that this is an important space. People then look up and they see around the top of the courtroom there's a, an extended panel of sculptural frieze. There's four panels in the frieze above the courtroom. The one in the back is a story of the allegorical story of the battle of good versus evil, and in the center of this is justice. And she's leaning on her sword, it's sheathed, but it's ready, she's ready for action if needed to protect the forces of good from the forces of evil. And among the forces of evil are despotic power, slander, and corruption. The forces of good on the other side are the defense of virtue and charity and peace. Behind justice is a, a figure of divine inspiration, which is holding the scales of justice in her hand. Out of that, you have this procession of the great lawgivers. It starts with an Egyptian pharaoh, Menes, who at the time was thought to be the earliest lawgiver known in the history of mankind. He's followed by other figures such as Moses holding the Ten Commandments, Octavian, some of the ancient Greek and uh, Roman lawgivers like Hergus, Salon. And then on the other side, you come into more modern times. You have Justinian, known for the Justinian Code, King John of the Magna Carta, and finally the most recent one, Napoleon. Now most people wouldn't think of Napoleon as someone you'd know for the law, but he was instrumental in creating the civil code, which is now used basically as in many of the European countries. It ends in that last figure where you have the majesty of law and the power of government sitting on a throne with the, the tablet of the Ten Amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, right in the center, with the American Eagle spreading its wings behind there. And on one side you have a group of citizens and they're protected by a lawyer or a judge. He's in a robe and he's holding a book of laws. 
And on the other side, you have another group of citizens, and there's a warrior in front of those. There's the authority of the law, but then you need to have the strength to back up what the law needs to be enforced by. It's amazing when you walk in kind of how fixed in time it is. Even the two American flags that flank the mahogany bench that they all sit at hang perfectly still. The Supreme Court is imbued in great tradition. In fact, we sometimes kid that the uh, quill pens that they give to the oral advocates are exactly how they write their opinions. And there are some justices who still write out their opinions in longhand on a legal pad rather than type at a computer the way most people would do today. The Supreme Court, rich with traditions, is also a very human institution. In a private room reserved for use by the justices, a newer custom takes place following oral arguments, one encouraged by its first female justice. beautiful room, very well furnished, but the food is not exactly oat cuisine. It comes from the public cafeteria. The justice eat, eat same things that any visitor to the court might choose for lunch. You will be surprised by the high level of collegiality here. Justice Scalia once commented that in his early years on this court, there was no justice with whom he disagreed more often than Justice Brennan. And yet, Justice Scalia considered Justice Brennan his best friend on the court at that time, and he thought the feeling was reciprocated. This is a tradition, eating lunch together, that was really pushed by Justice O'Connor when she was on the court, and it stuck. Justice O'Connor insisted that we have lunch every day when we were sitting. Now, Clarence, you should come to lunch. And she was really sweet, but very persistent. And I came to lunch as one of the best things I did. Um, it is hard to be angry or bitter at someone and break bread and look them in the eye. It is a fun lunch. Very little work is done there. It's just nine people, eight people, whoever shows up, having a wonderful lunch together. It is wonderful. I try not to miss a post-argument lunch because you never know what my colleagues will be talking about. Usually on an argument day, most of the justices are there in our dining room, and it is the rule there that we don't talk about the cases. My colleagues who go to the opera will talk about the opera. Some of us will talk about the, the baseball game or, or uh, the golf tournament. Some will talk about a good movie uh, they've seen or a good book they've read, uh, what, something particularly interesting their family's doing, the kind of things everybody would talk about at lunch with colleagues. Off the main justice's dining room is a smaller dining room for smaller functions known as the John Marshall Dining Room. And that's due to a sculpture that was placed there in the mid-1970s of John Marshall. Chief Justice Warren Burger decided that he wanted to make that the theme of the room. And so the court had been donated a portrait of William Marbury. And Marbury was the famous litigant in the case of Marbury versus Madison back in 1803. Chief Justice Burger said, we need to get a companion portrait for that, and so the great litigants, Marbury versus Madison, are on the wall, literally, of this small dining room. Marbury and Madison is probably the most famous case this court ever decided. The idea of judicial review for constitutionality, I think, is implicit in the constitutional document, but John Marshall made it explicit in the great case of Marbury against Madison. 
in all of the Supreme Court's history, there is no one case that says as much to a justice about what it is like to be a justice. Because Marbury versus Madison is, is the embodiment of judicial review. There's no quotation in all of the history of Supreme Court writing that justices more prefer to repeat than the phrase which says, it is emphatically the power and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is. That's a quote from John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison. We call him the great chief. He really was the first person to take the job seriously. He really established the court uh, in a prominent position as one of the three co-equal branches of government. The chief's responsibility is to preside at oral arguments and also to preside at the conference where the justices uh, vote on and decide the cases. That means I get to initiate the discussion uh, and have some responsibility uh, to make sure that all the issues are adequately aired uh, at conference. There is a change when the new chief justice is presiding at conference. Where each, each chief justice has his own uh, uh, ways, uh, method of handling and uh, presiding at the conference. And uh, the uh, uh, present chief justice is doing an excellent job and it has some virtues that the others didn't have. And, 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 but, but, but that's pretty much follows the tradition that's uh, been followed for many years. On the one hand, there's not much the Chief Justice can do. Uh, the, his uh, eight associate justices have a lifetime job. They have a duty to uphold the Constitution. Uh, he, he can't fire them. He's got to get along with them. Uh, we have traditions uh, which uh, will outlast any Chief Justice. And so the Chief Justice comes to a court uh, where there are these elements of stability and permanence and protection. Um, and, we, and we have our tradition and we have our oath. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Chief Justice who presides over our, our conference and uh, steers us through the mechanics of hearing the cases and calendars, uh, by his uh, personality and his warmth and his decisiveness, uh, and his understanding of the law and of the institution of his colleagues uh, can do a great deal uh, to set the tone. When I got here, my colleagues were very helpful uh, in filling me in on how things uh, worked, uh, often in contradictory ways, but you do get some sense about what's uh, expected uh, in the process. Um, and then you go in and do it and hold your breath and hope they all don't say at once, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> why, why are you doing that? And the real key is that my eight colleagues were extraordinarily helpful uh, in making me feel very comfortable. Um, I mean, imagine, it's not just that I was coming in as chief and the youngest among the bunch, and in many respects the least experienced uh, uh, as, a, as a judge, but they had been together for 11 years uh, without any change. Um, and you can easily imagine that that would be difficult. But every one of them, was, I think, went out of their way uh, to make me feel comfortable in the process, uh, for which I've always been very appreciative. In a moment, go behind the scenes to perhaps the most private and important room in the building, where the decisions of the court begin to take shape. No one can enter the room who is not a justice, no secretary, no law clerk, not even a message. There. I can still remember the first time I set foot in that room and those doors closed. And it's pretty daunting the first few times because that's where the actual work and the decision making takes place. And for more information about the Supreme Court, including a virtual tour of the building, the justices in their own words, a photo gallery on the construction of the Supreme Court building, and an interactive timeline on the history of the court, go to cspan.org slash Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, home to America's highest court, is one of three original documentaries from C-SPAN included in the American Icons DVD collection. Get your copy for $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Order at cspan.org slash store. You're watching C-SPAN, bringing you politics and public affairs.
our live call-in program about the news of the day, connecting you with elected officials, policymakers, and journalists. During the week, watch the U.S. House and our continuing coverage of the transition to the new Congress. And every weeknight, congressional hearings and policy forums. Also, Supreme Court oral arguments. On the weekends, you can see our signature interview programs. On Saturdays, The Communicators. And on Sundays, Newsmakers, Q&A, and Prime Minister's Questions from the British House of Commons. You can also watch our programming anytime at cspan.org. And it's all searchable at our C-SPAN video library. C-SPAN. Washington. Your way. A public service created by America's cable companies. We return now to C-SPAN's feature documentary, The Supreme Court, home to America's highest court. In the most private and perhaps important place inside the Supreme Court, nine justices, and only them, meet together around a table in the Justices' Conference Room. They discuss the cases heard at oral argument and begin the process of reaching a decision of the court. We sit at the conference table in the same places every day. I sit at one end, and then it wraps around the table in order of seniority. I can still remember the first time I set foot in that room and those doors closed. And my goodness, it's, um, it's pretty daunting the first few times um, because that's where the actual work and the decision making takes place. We don't have any observers in the conference room. No one can enter the room who is not a justice, no secretary, no law clerk, not even a message bearer. I have to be uh, professional and accurate and fair, and each of my colleagues feels the same way. So there's a little tension and excitement in the room, but we love it. We're lawyers. We're designed to do that. The job is no good if you can't argue. <laughs> <laughs> I initiate the discussion um, for an argued case. I'll say this case is about this. The arguments are so and so, and I think we should reverse or, or affirm, and here's why. Um, sometimes in an easy case, it will take you know, a minute. Um, in a hard case, it can, can take a lot longer. Now, one of the best rules, and I think it's true for any group, the rule of that conference is no one speaks twice until everyone has spoken once. Of course, I was most junior, but, so it helped me, but I think it's a very good rule. It produces a very good feeling because everyone feels that he's been heard. It's great to go first because you're the, you can tell the rest um, in, in a persuasive statement what you think of the case. But when you're on the end of that queue, you do have a certain advantage, that is, you know what the others think. It is not really a, an exercise in, in persuading each other. It's a, an exercise in stating your views, and the rest of us take notes, and that's its function. You take notes so that if you get assigned the opinion, you know how to write it in a way that will get at least four other votes besides your own. I was the most junior member of this court for 11 years. And it was always, when we had our conferences, since no one else is the room, was in the room, I had the special job of opening the door in case somebody knocked, you know. Somebody knocked, uh, usually somebody forgot a paper. Once they had coffee for Justice Scalia. But I said, well, I've been doing this for 10 years and he said, and I said, I, I think I've gotten pretty good at it. He said, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> he said, so we get on very well. I mean, the, the, the nine of us get on very well. I mean, who would want to be part of an institution where everybody uh, dislikes each other? You know, I think it's actually one of the great things about the court right now is that uh, even when people uh, disagree, and sometimes disagree sharply, uh, there are important questions, hard questions that people uh, have strong views on. Um, but that they can understand that that uh, that everybody is trying to do the best they can, and everybody's working really hard, and everybody uh, cares a lot about uh, about the law and about um, uh, this country as well. I just finished my 18th term, uh, and I still haven't heard the first unkind word in that room. And you think what we've decided: life and death abortion, execution, war and peace, financial ruin, government, 
relationship with citizens. You name it, we've decided it. Those discussions uh, lead the justice to conclude tentatively to affirm or reverse in the particular case. Now, that vote is not cast in concrete. You are not walking on wet concrete yet. You can change your mind. And it's not just win or lose, uh, reverse or affirm. It's what rationale you use, what principle you use to teach something. And if uh, there, the case is uh, close, five to four, and let's say you're on the side that prevailed the, the majority, there are not a lot of high fives and back slaps. And uh, there's a moment of quiet, a moment of respect. My most important responsibility is uh, the responsibility for assigning opinions uh, once the votes are in. If I'm in the majority, um, I get to determine who will write the opinion in that case. And that's a very important responsibility because you want to make sure that the assignment is given to the justice that commands, whose view commands the most support uh, on the court. You want to make sure the work gets done on time, so if someone's a little slower than others, make sure that person gets assignments, uh, heavy assignments earlier on. Some cases are more interesting uh, than others. You want to make sure those are fairly distributed. Some cases are harder than others. You want to make sure that's fairly distributed. Uh, we get all sorts of different issues. You want to make sure each justice has a nice mix. You don't want one justice just doing criminal cases uh, or, or something like that. So a lot of factors go into that decision, and it's a very important part of it. When we get through, we sometimes have coffee sent in and uh, maybe eat a, a sweet roll or cookie or something. As opinion writing assignments are handed out at the end of conference, a room exists upstairs in the Supreme Court which helps the justices and their staffs consult precedent through the words written in the countless legal volumes housed here. A room filled with not only books, but the symbolism of the great lawgivers, and admired by those few who enter into its mahogany grandeur. If they want to see the most beautiful room in Washington, they ought to go up to the library on the third floor that nobody hardly sees today. Uh, that's, that's not so much Roman classicism as, as Renaissance classicism, but it, it's, it is just a breathtakingly beautiful room. The library is probably one of the most special places in the building. The lunettes, the archways in the library represent science, law, industry. There are shields that are directly above the archways, and those represent various printer symbols. When I was clerking, I spent a lot of time in the library, and it was a gorgeous library. It wouldn't go there to read Supreme Court cases because those would be in our own chambers, but when looking for secondary materials of, of different kinds, we would go to the library and we would work with the librarians. It was a wonderful place to work. It was also a, a quiet place to work. The library is one of the special rooms in the building. Unfortunately, it doesn't get used as much as it was when the building was first opened, and that goes back to the way the court has changed the way it does things. When the court first moved into the building in 1935, they would literally call the docket each day in court. So you didn't know which case was necessarily going to be argued that day. You had an idea, but a lot of attorneys had to be on site because if their case came up, they needed to go down and be ready to argue it. So that's why you have the lawyer's lounge, which is a place for them to stay while they're waiting to find out which cases are going to be argued. And it's why you have this magnificent reading room here in the library. And this space is reserved for the use of the members of the bar and the court staff only. There have been a few times when I had to use material from so many cases that we occupied two or three of those tables, leaving the books out so that the law clerks and I could go up there and sit up in the reading room and actually refer to all those passages in the preparation of an opinion. With precedents in cases researched, in quiet chambers below this library, 
Justices go about the process of writing the opinions, both majority and dissenting, that eventually make their way to the public as the final decisions of the court. It's an ongoing process. You write a first draft. You figure out, well, I need to know a little bit more about how this case fits in. You go back and read the case. You're always going back and looking at the briefs, always bringing the law clerks in and bouncing ideas off of them. You know, what's wrong with it? It's sort of a continuation of the oral argument process. Deciding your view of the case itself is terribly challenging. Some of the issues are really tough. Some are not. Some are clear cut. But some are enormously challenging. And some cause you to want to wait yourself until you see other views expressed before being firm in your own view. And um, it is a help to see it in writing. And it's a help uh, when you have to write, to have to put it down in words rather than just think it through. Uh, it's, it's a real challenge. We have to convince ourselves. When I sit down and write an opinion, the first thing I do is convince myself. Uh, there's a lot of stuff goes in the wastebasket. Um, and then you have to convince others. So um, I, again, this, this, this court reminds you of the fact that you have this job to do. And when you w try to write something out, you sometimes learn things about the case that you didn't f fully appreciate or, or understand before. And there have been m uh, more than one case in which I have changed my views w when I was writing the opinion. As I have uh, often put it, I do not enjoy writing. I enjoy having written. I find writing a very um, uh, much difficult process. I sweat. I sweat over it. I write. I rewrite. I re rewrite again. I mean, uh, if, if, if before the opinion goes out, the law clerk will say, it's, "You know, it's going out this afternoon. You want to read it one last time?" I say, "Yeah, let me read it one last time." And I guarantee you, every every time I read it, I will change something else. So it finally, has to be wrested from my grasp and uh, sent down to the printer. I usually have to spend, write two or three drafts pretty much from scratch before I'm reasonably satisfied that we're going somewhere and then we edit them back and forth and when after they're edited back and forth, uh, um, I circulate it and I hope four other judges join. If four other judges join, I have the court. We realize that one of us is going to have to write out a decision which teaches and gives reasons for what we do. The, the point of writing an opinion is to command some allegiance to the result. And we have no army, we have no budget, we do not have press conferences and we don't give speeches saying how wonderful my dissent was or how bad the majority, we don't do that. We're judged by what we write. I would like my opinions to be uh, as, as, as clear as possible. I would like people to pick them up and understand them. I would like them to be as thoughtful as possible. I would like to write the kind of opinions which really do address the competing arguments. Don't try to sweep competing arguments under the rug, but try to, uh, to address them uh, uh, fairly and forthrightly. Now, once the person assigned to write for the majority opinion circulates an opinion draft, then the other eight have a chance to weigh in. And normally they start acting within a day or two. They'll read it and say, Dear Sandra, I join. Or Dear Sandra, I'll wait for the dissent. Or Dear Sandra, I want to give a little more thought to this before I act. Or Dear Sandra, if you will change A, B, C, and D to E, F, G, and H, I would be able to join. I mean, it's something like that that happens. Now, if there is a dissenting opinion to be written, often people will wait and look at the dissent before casting their vote. Now, once the dissent circulates, it could be so powerful that it causes someone who tentatively had been with the majority to change their view to some extent. So all of this, the details are worked out not around the conference table. It's in the writing of the opinions that the persuasion takes place. Let's say I would go the same direction, but I'd go 80 yards. But the majority only wants to go 60, and 60 would decide this case too. So I would write the opinion to go 60 and not say anything about, I would also go the other 20, 
yards. Now, if I were writing a concurrence or dissent on my own, I would write the opinion in a way reflects it. I would go 80. So we're going the same way. I could not write an opinion that went in a, in a direction that was different from what I actually thought we should go. The dissents here are very, uh, they, they, are, uh, they are rigorous uh, and, and uh, they don't pull punches. So I think it, it ultimately improves the quality of the, of the majority opinion, but it's, uh, it, it, it's something you have to anticipate. Dissents are more fun to write. I got to say that because uh, when you have the dissent, it's yours. You say what you want, and if somebody doesn't want to join it, who cares? You don't want to join my dissent? Fine. It's my dissent. This is what I want to say. When you're writing a majority, you do not have that luxury. You have to, you know, craft it in a way that uh, at least four other people can, can jump on, and, and actually you, you try to craft it in a way that as many people as possible will jump on, which means accepting some suggestions, uh, stylistic and otherwise, that really you don't think is the best, but are the best, but... Uh, Nonetheless, uh, in order to get everybody on board, you take them. If you're just starting out and someone says, I'd like you to change this or that, you're going to be very receptive. When you've got eight votes and the ninth one comes in saying, change this or that, you often say, well, you know, <laughs> not quite go fly a kite, but you know, uh, the fifth vote is, is a more critical one. You're more susceptible to uh, making changes than the, the ninth vote. The job is to get to it. We're not here in an academy to spin out theories. We're not here producing works that are never going to see the light of day. We're here to decide things. The job is to decide. We decide. God save the United States and this honorable court. Justice Alito has the opinion of the court this morning in case 08289, Horn versus Torres. This is our moment. The press grab the copies of the opinions and go rushing through. And the guy from Reuters is always the most pushy to get through because he wants to get on the wire service, so you better get out of his way. But the rest of us then go and either dictate or write. The remaining decisions will be issued on Monday. The Supreme Court Public Information Office simply says, here's the material, make of it what you will. But we will make sure you have the material. And that's an enormously invaluable function. And it's also very nice not to have the sense that somebody's trying to spin you. I personally do go up and want to hear the opinion announced from the bench. I like the, the pageantry of that. I like to hear the justice himself or herself announce what's in the opinion. Then I race down the stairs to the court press area where we all have our laptops set up now, and I write a first version of that story so that it can get on our internet site. Readers really want to know as soon as possible what the court ruled and potentially what that might mean. A lot of people say, well, it's a very secretive institution. No, it isn't. It's an institution that virtually does most of its work in the open. And as they like to say, the work comes in the front door and goes out the front door. You are just a few steps away from the uh, courtroom. Near the courtroom are two yeah. rooms used by the justices to occasionally speak to the public as well. From Thurgood Marshall's retirement announcement, to events with other justices over time, one can get a glimpse into the workings of the court and life here. But it is the private view of the ornately decorated East and West Conference Rooms and their portraits of past Chief Justices that helps one understand the history of the court. In the East Conference Room, we have the first eight Chief Justices' portraits. So you can go in there and you can talk about the portrait of John Jay, the first Chief Justice, and how he came to the court uh, appointed by George Washington. And then he gets elected to be governor of New York and decides that that's a better job than being Chief Justice of the United States. So he resigns and becomes governor of New York. And then you have a beautiful portrait of John Marshall by Rembrandt Peel. Here's the great Chief Justice himself in a grand portrait, very similar to the one of George Washington in the Capitol building. And there's a chance to talk about John Marshall, to let people know his story. And that carries through over into the West Conference and with the more modern justices, where in fact you have the two instrumental justices in this building. William Howard Taft on one wall and Charles Evans Hughes above the fireplace looking at each other through time. I like to go sometimes on a quiet night to the conference rooms because the portraits on the walls, eight in one room and eight in the other, are all my predecessors as Chief Justice. 
To some extent, you look up at them on the, on the walls with a degree of awe, appreciation for what they've been through. They're probably looking down at me with either bemusement or amazement. Each of them has a special story to tell, not only personally, but with the institution of the court. You look up at Marshall and appreciate the importance for him of having the court function as a court, moving the court from a situation where each justice wrote his own opinion and instead saying, no, we're going to have an opinion of the court, which was vital in, in establishing the court and its present form. Right next to Roger Tawney, the most unfortunate of my predecessors, the author of the Dred Scott decision, and you understand that he saw this great problem in the country of slavery and he was going to solve it and this is how he was going to solve it, and tremendously misguided and injured the court for generations to come. So that helps inform how you look at your own job. You walk down a little further and you see Morrison Waite. You had a thousand lawyers and law professors and said, who is Morrison Waite? Not one of them would, well, maybe a couple of them would know. And that's a good lesson in, you know, the job doesn't give you a prominent role or historical significance just because you hold the job. You look at Melville Fuller and you understand his role in making sure the court functioned collegially. You go in the next room and you see Charles Evans Hughes and you recall his vital role in turning back the court backing plan and you think about uh, the importance of the independence of the judiciary. Things like that. From time to time I find it a, a, a useful uh, a reminder of uh, the role of the court and the, the role of the Chief Justice. As time moves forward, this building will remain timeless, and the work of its institution inside will still be tied to past precedent and tradition. But in many other ways, it is a forever changing place, defined by the human beings serving there as justices, all trying to interpret a document over 200 years old in the context of an ever-changing world. You really can't judge judges unless you know the materials that they're working with. You can't say, oh, this is a good decision, and this was a good court, simply because you like the result. It seems to you that the person who deserved to win won. That's not the business judges are in. We don't get it right all the time. Uh, this is a, a human institution, uh, and it has the the same susceptibility to error than any other human institution has. We have 300 million people. Probably have 900 million points of view. I mean, people in this country don't agree about a lot of things. And despite enormous disagreement, they've decided to resolve their differences under law. What I do get a fulfillment from is living up to the oath to do it the right way and to know that on behalf of my fellow citizens, I've tried to be faithful to their constitution, to our constitution. What I see, I think, uh, has been very inspiring because I think you have uh, nine people who are working really hard and who are uh, trying the best that they're able uh, to do something uh, uh, really important in this country. I think the most important thing for the public to understand is that we're not a political branch of government. Um, they don't elect us. Um, if they don't like what we're doing, uh, it's more or less just too bad, uh, other than uh, impeachment, which has never happened, or, or conviction on impeachment has never happened with the court. So they need to understand when we reach a decision, it's based on the law and not a policy preference. We have the Constitution and the laws, and I think they mean something. They don't necessarily mean what I want them to mean in every instance. They mean something, and th I think the people of the United States trust us to interpret and apply those laws fairly and even-handedly and, and objectively. And that's what, that's the great responsibility that we have. The Supreme Court, in general, has been uh, respected by the American people. I think it's been uh, one of the institutions of government that is most respected. So it isn't size that makes the grandeur or the specialness of the place. It's what it symbolizes and what goes on here that makes it special, and it is.